For many people, involvement in the pro-life movement might involve an internship, weekly activism, or even just going to the March for Life. But we want to share with you how this can be a sustainable career that pushes the pro-life movement towards a world in which abortion is unthinkable. And we are joined by none other than Mark Harrington, Executive Director of Created Equal. All right, folks, Cam Cote coming back at you. Thank you for joining the Pro-Life Guys podcast. And thankfully, you're not stuck with me all by myself again. I know that I was on my own for Jordan Guilford's episode a little while ago, but I'm joined by the actual host of the show, Peter Boss. We figured that we'd change it up for a second. I would do the intro. Peter, how are you doing? You are done school as of today from what we were talking about offline. How does that feel? Uh, I wish I wish that was actually true. What I'm done, Cam, uh, uh, are my projects for mm. school. Um, I do have five exams coming up uh, in <laughs> starting next week from from when we're recording. So by the time this episode airs, actually my exams will be done. So hopefully I did well on those. But uh, at time of recording, I do have exams still left to write. So I, I like to think that part of my course, <laughs> part of my work is done. Uh, but there's still a big five hurdles. Uh, left to go before I am done completely, sir. Uh, done, done, done school. Um, no more will I be a student for life, um, which is a joke we have from time to time. Students for life <laughs> groups are usually pro-life groups. But anyway, anyway, uh, I digress. Uh, welcome everyone to the Pro-Life Guys podcast. My name is Peter, as Cam said, and we are two guys who are passionate about ending the killing of preborn children here in Canada, which is where we are. But this podcast is not limited to cam- uh, to Canada because our goal with this podcast is to give you, the listener, wherever you might be, the tools you need to change minds, to save lives, and to transform our culture. And today we're going to be focusing on what that looks like long term by looking at the life and the story of none other than Mark Harrington, as you, Cam, said off the top. So uh, we'll get to that in just a moment. If you haven't hit that subscribe button, please do so. Please hit the like button. Um, we always talk about the algorithm and, uh, I mean, we read about the algorithm a lot, but even if you just want to do it just to make Cam and I feel better, uh, because we love seeing those likes, then, uh, that would warm our hearts. Cam, I know you have an upcoming course as well before we dive into the conversation. So maybe share a little bit about what is coming down the pipes for you. I will do that in just a moment. Going back to the social media thing, not just pumping our tires. I was talking to my my colleague, Quiana Casamayor, who we had on the show a couple months ago, talking with Blaze Elaine on social media. Apparently, I have had algorithms all mixed up in my head. Apparently, by liking our posts, we appreciate the likes. It it boosts our, our confidence and morale and whatnot. By liking our content, it will simply boost the algorithm of how much of our content you will see. It doesn't actually change the content for other people. How you do that is by commenting. If you can comment and or share the post, we would absolutely love that. Even if it's a matter of like, good episode, guys, or I like this, or I like that, or whatever. Give us a shout out on there. If you comment, not only will you see more of our content, but you will also boost the algorithms for other people so that more people are seeing the content as well. Love it. Moving on. Thanks, Quiana. The course. Absolutely. Quan is a champ. Um, She listens very often. She's a wonderful, wonderful um, team member out of Calgary here. Um, The course that you mentioned, Peter, I'm super fired up. I'm actually in the the process of honing exactly what it's going to entail. It's a three-week course. It's shorter than the last one that I ran, and it is not based off of the book Stuck entirely. A lot of stuff from the book Stuck by our colleague Justina Van Manen will be in it. But this is basically how do you have better conversations about abortion? And so for many people, especially those who've been tuning in to the show for a long time, hopefully you have at least the basic um, framework for how to have competent conversations about abortion. This course is all about taking that to the next level. There will be one top um, session focused on each of knowledge, wisdom, and character. And I know that those are super elementary topics, but we're going to try to get fairly deep into each of them. The knowledge component, I'm going to break down how to build good analogies. Analogies are some of the trickiest things that we have. Analogies that are actually going to resonate and actually move you in the direction that you want to go. Not only that, but we'll talk about some of the more um, hard-hitting questions that we are hearing more and more on campuses right now. Session two is all about wisdom, and this wisdom is going to be about how to apply your knowledge effectively in different scenarios. This is going to be how to use body language, how to use humor 
how to use seriousness and um, conversational management to be able to optimize the impact of your engagement. And the third session is all going to be about character. How do you cultivate a meaningful human connection with the person that you're um, talking with? So this isn't just an argument or a conversation that they're going to forget about five minutes later but rather a profound encounter that may very well, and I'm not, not exaggerating, may very well alter the course of their life in how you engage with them. That's not to put pressure on you. That is to speak to the opportunity that you have. And I want to share some of the tips that I've learned over the last um, 12 years and how you can have better conversations about abortion. So you can sign up on our website, prolifeguys.com, go to the courses um, area. I know that's not a tab, but find the course, sign up. It's 25 bucks um, for the three sessions. And that money goes towards building up the, the podcast, but also goes towards developing our internships so that we can reach more people across Canada. And so please do sign up. If you have questions, hit us up on social media. Um, but I'd love to see up to, I'm going to cap it at 25 people. Hopefully we can get in that 20 to 25 kind of range um, and have some really cool dis discussions on the go. Love it, sir. Uh, there's also a round table coming up. You want to briefly yeah. highlight that? Yeah. So unfortunately, we still don't have absolute details at the time of recording, but they probably will be on the website by the time of posting. And so we are going to be having two legends in Canada's pro-life movement, possibly people that you have heard on the podcast before, who will be sharing their experience, their story, and their journey within Canada's pro-life movement. This episode, um, as Peter, you alluded to, is all about... Um, understanding our roots and stability within the pro-life movement. This is going to be a lot of the history of Canada's pro-life movement that a lot of people are not very familiar with. And so this is going to be in early May. Check the website again for more details and to get an invite, sign up as a Patreon supporter, whether, and I emphasize this, whether as a financial supporter or as an active volunteer on Patreon, you can only sign up as a financial partner, but we want to validate and really celebrate the time commitments of so many of our incredible volunteers. And so if you want an invite as an active volunteer, you don't have to start donating money necessarily. We'd love it if you did, but you don't necessarily have to do that. If you can go on our Patreon page, patreon.com slash pro life guys, you can find all the different um, levels of activism that can get you the perks of being a Patreon supporter um, as well. So do check that out. Do join us for this round table where we'll have a lot about the history of Canada's pro life movement. Perfect. Thank you, sir. Mark Harrington is our guest today. He, let me go to my page for a moment. Prior to launching Created Equal from 1999 to 2011, Mark served as the executive director of the Midwest Office of the Center for Bioethical Reform, where he led the Genocide Awareness Project on college campuses, which reached millions of students with massive mobile, dis mobile displays conveying the hor horrifying reality of abortion. Uh, now at Created Equal, Mark is realizing his vision of uniting human rights defenders to carry on the fight to end abortion. Over the years, Created Equal has built a state-of-the-art delivery system that specializes in transforming formerly apathetic students into long-term foot soldiers in the war against ab abortion and more broadly in the culture of death. Mark himself has been in the movement for several decades now, and we are here to learn about how he continues in the movement, how he responds to hostility, how he has a family in the movement, and so many different things, uh, questions that you might have if you're considering full-time involvement in the pro-life movement in one way or another. So this is the episode for you. This is our conversation with Mark Harrington. Mark, thank you so much for taking the time and joining us on the podcast. Good to be here. Yeah, it's good to have you, especially after the last conversation we had with our patrons uh, several months ago. So we're excited to have you back. I wanted to start just by looking at your last few weeks. You had a justice ride with Created Equal. You had yeah. an event in New York with multiple organizations joining and doing pro-life mm -hmm. activism there. I know some of our colleagues came down from Canada to join and participate in the work you were doing there. And then there's the the news of what's happened in Washington, D.C. with uh, those aborted babies discovered, some of them late term, um, very late term. And there's sort of this ongoing, you know, Supreme Court case in the air and, and so much going on in the mm -hmm. United States right now, so much going on yeah. in uh, the abortion war. I'm just wondering, Mark, um, 
How are you doing? <laughs> We're hanging in there. I mean, this has been an exciting time for Create Equal, and I think the uh, the effort to you know, outlaw abortion in America. We're, we're excited about the possibilities that are ahead of us. And, you know, this is our peak season. I mean, the Justice Ride is our premier project. I see it as a training vehicle to kind of the uh, entry into our work where we can put people on a bus, take them to college campuses and train them how to defend the pro-life position with people that disagree with them. And so we had a great trip to Florida. We followed up with going to New York City. And that that was interesting because it was more of a mentoring, uh, if you would, uh, event where we had leaders from different organizations that are like minded, kind of kindred spirits like you guys send their folks with us for a week to kind of get together and do outreach, but mostly just get to know each other share ideas. And I think um, it may set a precedent. Hopefully we're going to be able to do something like this again. Uh, as the, uh, as the, uh, the organizations that use abortion victim photography, I think expands over North America. People, more people are doing it and it's a great opportunity to get everybody together. And so that was what New York City was all about. So, uh, and then you got the DC events that happened right after that. I wasn't in the middle of all of that, but I did get a phone call from A.J. Hurley, who is uh, one of the individuals that was with us in, in New York City, and he was involved in that. Uh, he's the man that actually was uh, the one handling, unfortunately had to handle the babies. He documented the, uh, the, the children. He filmed the, those folks, uh, the, the children. And so I was in contact with him over that period of time. So I've been a little bit involved in that event. Gotcha. Just so much on the go. And and mm -hmm. for anyone who is not familiar with the, the wild unfolding story from Washington, D.C., Mark, you've covered a lot of it on your show, The Mark Harrington Show, um, Radio mm -hmm. Activist. Um, and so we definitely yeah. want to suggest people get up to speed on that. And, and I'm curious, I, I want to dive a little bit deeper into this. And kind of the theme of this show, Mark, as, as you and I talked about before, as we were leading up to this interview, is kind of long-term strength and stability in the pro-life movement, that that for so yeah. many, this is a not quite a flash in the pan sort of thing, but we do a, a highly intensive summer internship or maybe a year or two of mm -hmm. mission work, and then mm -hmm. we get burnt out for for one reason or mm -hmm. another reason. And I'm, I'm curious how you and the team have been processing everything that's come out in Washington, D.C. in particular, in mm. that I'm sure that for many people, you're, you're seeing the outrage, the surprise, the how could this possibly be happening? And yet I'm sure that in the back of your mind, you're thinking about the David mm. DeLayden stories, the, the Kermit sure. Gosnell and countless others. How mm. do you process the horrific nature of abortion on a daily basis and bring that with passion and meet people where they're at when they are realizing this for the first time, potentially. Mm -hmm. And, and you maybe in the back of your mind, you're wondering how, how did you not know this was happening? Why is this still surprising? This disgusting underbelly of the pro abortion movement. How do you piece that together in your mind? How does your team kind of work through that and stay charitable with the people that you're talking to, maybe even pro-lifers yeah. in particular? Yeah, I mean, for our organization, which deals with abortion victim photography on a daily basis, I mean, we stand in front of these signs, we see the videos. This was a wake up call for us as well. Uh, the videos are horrific. In fact, I don't think I've ever seen footage like this in the 30 years I've been doing pro-life act, uh, activism. Uh, we know it happens every single day, but even with an organization like Created Equal, that is a very activist organization, we're really committed people here. It was a wake up call to even us that, you know, we live in a, it's easy to to, to punch the clock, even with the work that we do. And, and it becomes, it can become a job to us. And this was a reminder that it's not a real job. It's a calling. It's, it's a ministry to serve Jesus and the babies. And it was uh, just a real wake up call to see that there are individuals. And that's why the, the folks in Washington, I, you know, I get, we owe them a debt of gratitude for their, for their, uh, their valor to do what they did. It showed us that, Real flesh and blood babies are dying every single day, some of them in their third trimester in our nation's capital and in places around America. And we can't lose sight of that because abortion can simply become an issue to be debated, 
not a genocide that needs to be abolished. And I think that's was the message that we we came out of after the events in uh, in, in in Washington. Yeah, that's absolutely key. Like you said, it's so easy to to hit that time clock and to think of mm-hmm. the debate because that's what we're doing, right? We're going to university right. campuses, we're going to colleges. You're doing the justice right as we're we should. Right. That's right, and we're having these conversations, and it's easy to think of it as the debate now. Uh, stories like what happened in Washington, D.C. don't come out every week and don't give us that no. uh, sort of necessary realignment, as it were. And Mark, you've been involved in the movement for many years. So what are some of the the sort of tactics you've used, perhaps, or what are some of the habits that you've um, formed for yourself that help you to really remember that this is a genocide that we're dealing with? This is a, a, a massive injustice on a scale that we can't fathom in our minds. Um, how do you how do you keep that perspective on such a long period of time? Well, I you know I took a, a, an experience in the state of Maine. I don't know if you've ever been to Maine, but Bar Harbor, Maine. I took a vacation with my family and just really had. A, if you have children, you know what a vacation looks like. It's not really a vacation, but I got about ten. Yeah, you know, I got about ten minutes of on my own to just sit there on a mountain on one of the big hills overseeing the beauty and all. And I was praying, and the Lord basically said to me. You think you can end this by yourself? I see every baby. I see them all. And that was really, it was a free moment for me because I think we we kind of uh, take it on ourselves. Uh, you know, this is a burden that no human being can carry individually. We just can't. It's too heavy. It's too deep. I mean, it's it's so awful. And it was just a reminder that God sees every single baby that's disemboweled and decapitated in America and across the world. And it's really his burden to carry. And so it, it was a kind of a wake up call to me to, to get back to the basics. I'm not going to end abortion by myself. I think we all think we might be able to do that. We have the answers. We know how to do all of this. And, and it's going it, to it comes down to us. But we got We got to get rid of that thinking. And know that we just we have a part to play. We got to know what that part is and fulfill that and then try not to to let every single thing that happens around us to change that perspective and the direction that we've been given by the Lord. And so that's kept me over the last 30 years to realize that stories like in, in, in Washington, D.C., not to minimize them, because obviously it, it's awful and we need to pay attention to what's going on there. But that's happening day in, day out across the, the globe. The Lord sees them all. Our part is to just fulfill his calling in our particular area of expertise or gifting, if you want to call it that, and just be faithful. So. Love it. Love that direction of, of faithfulness. And I, I'm curious, um, I'm, I'm sure that, again, this is something that's bounced around in your mind. You've, you've been running internships for, I, I believe, probably around a dozen years now. You've, you've been that's working right. with multiple different groups and whatnot. And I'm sure that you've had people that have floated onto the radar and then floated off of the radar and people who mm-hmm. have taken on that calling and have moved on. And I, I wonder, kind of building on that, how do you balance in your mind the fact that there's some people that, that God is going to call into this movement for a shorter period of time, some for a longer period of time, but sometimes people leave of their own volition. Some people are, are drawn. I, I, that's kind of a messy question, I guess, but, but that kind of thing, <laughs> how do you work to inspire passion and dedication amongst your team members while knowing that not everyone has the exact same calling as yourself necessarily, if that makes sense? Makes total sense. Uh, I, I ask people to count the cost up front. Uh, we're, we're honest to the, to the calling. We, we understand the gravity of the issue. We know it's a life-changing realization if you come to understand what's going on uh, across the globe when it comes to abortion. And so I, I tell them, I mean, if you're going to jump into this, you need to count the cost. Jesus commanded us to do that before we enter into an endeavor. And so if you're going to commit yourself to this work, you got to know what you're getting into. So we don't sugarcoat things here. We're, we're straightforward with everybody. I'd rather just have a few committed people that have count the cost, have, have plot out their course than those who might come and go 
uh, and, and, you know, want to be part of it for a little while because it might be the cool thing to do uh, without actually uh, weighing what that might mean to them long term, because we're looking to raise up a, the next generation of leaders here. And we understand that that's a commitment that may be, you know, years, if not decades. And people need to understand that they can do this if they pace themselves, they make some commitments as far as how they're going to go about living their lives. So they, there's some balance. Uh, you know, if they marry, they can do that. They can raise support. They can raise a family. It all can be done, but it has to be done uh, professionally, logically, and not just you know, the spur of the moment with an emotional decision jumping in because that won't last. Uh, Jesus warned us against that, of course, with the, the parable of the seed and the sower, that, you know, those those seeds that were planted in the rocky soil don't last, last long because when the heat comes and the sun comes, you know, they they, they wilt and, and dry up and then they, they're good for nothing. So that's where who, who we're, we are here. I'd rather have a, a, a handful of dedicated people who are have counted the cost than a hundred or 200 or a thousand people that haven't. Mm -hmm. Could you dive a little bit more into what that cost is, Mark? You've been doing this for mm -hmm. a few decades. You've uh, run yep. uh, created equal um, since 99, I believe. Um, right. unless, is that right? That's, okay. so, that's close. <laughs> okay. 2011 okay. officially. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> my, my bad. Um, 2011. Okay. But you, you were involved way before that as well. Um, right. So in terms of sort of, relationships that we have. So you talked about getting married in terms of uh, our mm -hmm. financial situation, in terms of our perhaps mental health, our personal health, in terms of uh, so many things. I mean, the trajectory of our lives, the fact that, you know, just, just so many different things, maybe speak from mm -hmm. your experience. What are some of the costs that we should be thinking about um, as we consider, you know, working to end this injustice or really to yeah, fight this injustice? Yeah, uh, for, for somebody that's just new to this, maybe they're a novice, they've just come to be aware of what's going on, as I did, you know, a long time ago when I first saw an aborted baby, I thought, oh my gosh, this can't be happening. You know, I've got to do something about it. That's great. You know, that kind of realization is exactly what we want out of folks, but they need to be mentored by those who have been around. And I was fortunate enough to be mentored by people like Greg Cunningham and others who, you know, looked at the long view. Uh, knowing that this isn't going to end overnight, knowing that we can't do it alone and coming up with ideas, projects, tactics that actually can set the course forward to change culture. And so that's part of it. Being professional and businesslike is part of it. Despite the fact that this is a genocide, it deserves urgency, but we can't let the urgency override our uh, need to be systematic in how we go about our business here. So I think those are important things. Uh, I think you can, um, we see a lot of people come and go in our movement. I've seen families, I've seen uh, marriages destroyed over uh, the inability to balance activism and a proper you know, Christian life, marriage, children, all of the good things, right? I've seen those things before me, and I've learned not to follow in that path. But I've also had great mentors in my own life where I've seen folks that have been able to balance this, but yet take the long view. Because as we get older, and I'm now much older than I was when I started, I want to see this carry on beyond me. Uh, it can't be just about me. It, I don't want it to die with me. I want our movement to continue on, our work here at Created Equal to carry on long beyond when I'm uh, when I'm gone. So those are the kind of things that I think have helped. I, I made a commitment early on not to go into debt. Uh, that's important. <laughs> we don't want to ruin us our, ourselves financially. I committed to my wife that we wouldn't uh, go into debt personally, that we wouldn't spend personal, financial. I mean, not I, I, there's some wiggle room here, but not to go into debt personally to fund the work. That if God is going to, if you're called to the work, God's going to provide it, provide the financial uh, means to do it. So those are the kinds of things that I think that have helped me uh, stay in it for so long. That That's so valuable. And I think it's so important that, that you're so upfront with all of the people that are coming into the movement because I, mm -hmm. and, and this is this is not a shot over the bow of, of <laughs> the people who are running CCBR when I first got involved. But I, <laughs> when I got involved, I, I think I was making like, 
$1,200 a month for the first three years that I came on staff. I was massively in debt. I ate lentils for almost every single meal um, for like two and a half years. Um, and and just that that kind of understanding of, I, I have learned a lot of this through people such as yourself over the last kind of eight years that I've been in the movement, not in the first three years that I was in the movement. And I wonder within, within your range, so I, I joined the movement as a single guy and and I had a lot of this. Well, all I need is twelve hundred dollars a month to live. I can pay rent. I can. I lentils are are good and and a complete protein <laughs> and all that kind of thing. When when you got involved with with CBR and now created Equal, were you already right. married, or did you kind of learn some of these lessons partly through um, kind of mentors like Greg, but partly through your own kind of lived experience of oh, really sorry, honey, I. We're we're gonna get skim milk this week because, or we're gonna water down our milk because. Oh, and and then yeah. he kind of sat down with that lesson, I guess. Well, I was married. Uh, my wife okay. was the one that introduced me into the the old subject matter. She was the one that showed me the board of baby. She was the one that was uh, volunteering for a pregnancy resource center at the time. So she was the one. I you know I can go back and blame her for everything that <laughs> went wrong, or right? I can say, well, you're the one who did it, not me. Uh, but no, we were already married, and so and and also I had a background in business. I was in sales. I also ran. Uh, a business. Um, so I had some of that at background that, you know, I understood that if I was going to do this long term, that I needed to be business like and being around individuals like Greg Cunningham, who is very professional and wanted to professionalize activism. I bought into that vision because that's where I wanted to go. I didn't want it to just be about me. I didn't want it to just be me alone. <laughs> you know, that isn't going to get the job done. We have to raise up the generation to continue the work. So that's that's what really set us forward. And, um, I, you know, making commitments, sticking to those, setting boundaries in your life. In other words, you know, if you want to work about 40 hours a week, 40, 45, but not 70, you know, that's just not going to work. You know, if you want to... Try to end at five o'clock, you know, and be home for dinner and be at the at the dinner table with your family. Those things are important. Don't take work after work. Don't be working at eight, nine o'clock. It's okay to check your email here or there, but it shouldn't bleed into everything, right? Your family has to have some set, set time for dad to be home with them and to not be uh, this to be bleeding into everything that you do. Uh, one other important thing for those who have children I think there's room for us to protect them. And I don't mean protect them from the issue altogether, but abortion's a very heavy thing to handle. Adults have a hard time handling it, of course. Children have a harder time handling that. And I think there's ways that we can also protect our families from what we carry every single day. If we're doing this full-time or even doing it part-time or volunteer, uh, it, it just can't dominate every conversation that you have with everyone, including your family. It's just it's just too heavy and weighty over the years. You burn out and you just get it can depress you unless you have a, a focus on Jesus and your walk with him. It'll it'll ruin you. And, and so those are the kind of things that we set into place early on and been pretty faithful to that over the last several decades. Love it. I, I would love to loop back around to that kind of faith journey as as the mm. conversation unfolds. But you brought up the the kid factor, and I'd love to, to tap mm. your brain on that one as well. You've got kids. I've met several of your kids through various right. outreach projects that I've done. And I'm curious, the the balance of kind of shepherding kids into your own shoes, I guess. And and I say that because mm. I feel like every time one of us at CSPR, there there's a lot of us that are having kids right now. I've got my second on the way. Peter, you and your wife just had your second. The, the joke always runs through of like, oh, we won't even have to recruit interns in 15 years because all of our kids <laughs> will just be our interns kind of thing. And obviously, like you said, we want to raise our children in our in our worldview with a passion for pro-life. But how do we, did you make a conscious decision that it wasn't going to be a mandatory thing that all of the Harrington kids were going to work for created equal sort of thing, oh, that this yeah. wasn't an obligation? How did you balance mm -hmm. impressing upon your children the fact that this is a massive issue, but that it's not mm -hmm. the only worthwhile thing to do with your life, I guess? Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, uh, 
as a family, we're a ministry family. I mean, we are missionaries, and they know that. That's who we are. They see their dad and their mother dedicated to this work, and I think that's a very good thing, of course, right? Children need to see that. They need to know that their family is dedicated to the mission of the gospel, to the, you know, discipling the nations, to abolishing abortion, all those things. And so my my children were brought up doing the events, going on the justice rides and and being involved in activism and training and all those things that surrounded Created Equal and, and the Center for Bioethical Reform. But I never made it uh, a mandatory thing that they would have to work for me or work for Created Equal, because I understood just with my own calling that I think it's something people have to make their own minds up about. And once my children became adults, and they all are now, some have worked for me, some continue to work for me at some level or another, and down the road, they may work for me full time. I have no idea. That's going to be between them and the Lord. Uh, They're going to have to make that decision themselves. So I never felt like it, it was something they had to do There was no pressure, no guilt manipulation. They did it freely as children, of course. And as adults, they're going to have to make their minds up as to what they do with their lives. And so I think that's the right position to take. Just as we are recruiting people here at Created Equal, we we set a high bar and we're we're making the calling. It's It's a hard calling. We understand that. But we want those who are committed to come in. And I think that's the same with our family and with our children. We don't want people to come for the wrong motives, for the wrong reasons. And so we want them to come in freely, understanding this is a calling. Because if they weigh the cost and they make that decision, they're going to be in it for the long run. Yeah. So you mentioned faith a few times, Mark. Um, You mentioned, you know, for your kids, it's between them and the Lord. For you, your faith was important and is important in this work. And I wonder if you could elaborate on that a little bit, just to dive in. Why why is it important for you to have a faith in our Lord Jesus uh, doing Mm -hmm. this work? We work alongside um, pro-life atheists. We work alongside pro-lifers who um, Mm -hmm. have a variety of different faiths um, or belief systems or whatever. But could you speak to yours specifically? Why is it essential for you to have such a strong faith in Jesus to do this work? Yeah, when I'm asked why I do what I do, I say it's because I'm a follower of Christ. I'm a disciple of Jesus, and he commands us to not shed innocent blood. He commands us to speak up for those who cannot speak up for themselves. So that's what animates me. But that doesn't mean it's a religious question altogether. We all understand that, that there are other ways of going about debating this, the logic, the philosophy, the science, all of we we get all of that. And we need to have that comprehensive worldview. But that's what animates our faith. And my first love is Jesus and fidelity to him and his word. And that's something we we drill down deep here at at Created Equal. We understand that, uh, you know, you can get distracted if you allow abortion and the abolition of abortion to become an agenda item for you, like the primary thing of your life. You're going to go off course. You will. I can guarantee it. It'll happen. I've seen it happen. And you'll get off and you just kind of get pushed around by, uh, you know, every whim (laughs) and every thought, every idea, every shiny object, the next novelty, the next fad or whatever it might be. Instead of staying firmly grounded in your faith and, uh, like I say, the fidelity to Christ and his word, because that will help us in the long run. If we are faithful to his word then the Lord promises to bless us and the work that we're doing. And so I was early on, I was a member of an event at one of my churches that I have been to several, unfortunately, but one of the churches that I attended where one of the folks who were praying for me said, don't let this become an agenda. And initially, I didn't know what he meant, but that mattered to me after a while. I thought about that. And I thought, that's right. That's right. I can't make abortion why I, you know, do what I, why I live, you know, that that's not the purpose of what I'm here for. I'm here to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, be faithful to him, obey his word. And along with that comes obviously speaking out against abortion and doing what I can to end the shedding of blood. But if you keep Jesus front and center, then I think everything else will flow from that. That's that's good. I want to shift gears a little bit, Mark, and talk about some of the hostility as well. I mean, it's, it's certainly connected to uh, what we've been talking about and your faith plays an important role. But 
being part in the pro-life, being active in the pro-life movement, being activists like we are showing the uncomfortable truth of what abortion does to preborn children. Um, I mean, it, it brings a lot of pushback and hostility from the university mm -hmm. campuses we go to and from uh, pro-abortion supporters. Right. Um, in many ways, uh, in some ways, rather, uh, there's some pushback from um, people within the movement as well who think that this strategy is harsh and, and perhaps not, you know, unlike what Jesus would do or anything like that. That's a another conversation. But I think there are also yeah. different factions in the pro-life movement as well. They wouldn't perhaps call themselves pro-life, but hey, there's people against abortion um, who have different differing political strategies, differing many strategies. And there's there's intense pressure that comes from there as well. And so you're in a position, Mark, um, and, and you feel this perhaps more acutely than we would being um, in the United States where you are and where the abortion war is far larger than it is here in Canada where you are in many ways receiving hostility and pushback from multiple sides uh, mm -hmm. as you seek to be faithful. How do you, how do you deal with this? How do you work through this? Do you, you know, ignore certain, certain types of hostility and, and try to focus on this kind? How do you work through it and how do you respond? I ignore it all. <laughs> Honestly, I, I, I almost ignore it all. I, I, I think that that's just something that we've been committed to. I've always felt that way. My calling is is clear. I know that I'm being faithful to what I've been given to do, and I don't get distracted. I don't listen to the, I call them barking dogs on the parade route. Uh, <laughs> if you listen to the barking dogs all the time who are nipping at your heels as you're going about your work, you'll get distracted and off into these tangents. And it'll kill your joy, by the way, <laughs> if you're always yep. dealing with the naysayers <laughs> and the people that tell you you're, what you're doing is wrong or, or all of that stuff, the drama, if you will, within and without the pro-life movement, then you will, you will lose sight of why you're doing what you're doing. So that's one thing we've been able to accomplish here is just stay focused. And it's because we're, we know what we do works, too. I mean, we know it. We see it. We have all the evidence necessary. Uh, it's a, still astounds me to this day that not everybody does it. <laughs> I mean, it's just crazy, but that doesn't keep me up at night. It, it did. It used to. And I just thought, OK, you know, that's that's up to them. They got to make up their own minds as to how they're going to spend their time. Uh, I have to be faithful. And that's where I think that's the, the lesson I learned is is just block out the noise, block out the noise. Love it. I and and I feel like that is that were uh, the not worldview, but but that mantra is encapsulated by one of my favorite pictures of all time, let alone from within the pro life movement, of a picture of you with a bullhorn, and there's some guy <laughs> yelling at you with his uh, middle fingers raised, and just yeah. there's Mark calm and serene, <laughs> just in the face of this fella that that is clearly spewing all sorts of things. I'm sure at you. <laughs> Just the calmness there. I have so much appreciation for that. Um, well, it's a gen you know, I like the word gen this isn't me. Flip Ben, I'm a good friend of mine from Operation Rescue called a gentle warrior. Mm. Uh, you know, you know who you are, know who you are, right? Be who yeah. you are, and then let anything, whatever comes, you're ready for it. Yeah. Uh, and, and even if it includes the kind of hostility that we we face in and out the, on the campuses, anywhere we go, the that type of thing. Just you're ready for it. You're prepared for it. You're resolute. And and that's the that's what I think is the personification of the way we should act in our work is being able to handle that type of hostility uh, that separates us from a lot of individuals in the movement. And it's yeah. not to put them down, but it's just there is a different level of, um, I don't know, the ability to handle those kinds of things that, that characterizes our work. Absolutely, absolutely. At one point, I'm going to make it into a motivational poster for our interns that, that we'll have up there with the image and some quote from you underneath it, just so you know. We'll, se we'll send you a copy as well. Um, <laughs> okay, cool. That was <laughs> a that John Kerry, John Kerry running for president. That was a, a rally that he held, by the way, just so you gotcha. know. Gotcha. Gotcha. I uh, appreciate the context. I'll, I'll have to get ago. more of, of the, <laughs> the, the dates and times and whatnot. Um, I, I'd love to move into, so you've been leading um, Created Equal as the executive director since 2011. You had executive right. director of um, a, a regional area before that for CBR. I'd love mm -hmm. to tap your brain when it comes to the management, not only, and we'll get into the management of people, but also the the strategy and the the tethering of strategy 
and the developing of strategy in that culture, society, and by that we mean the individuals within society are are changing in some ways, mm -hmm. but not in every mm -hmm. way. And I, I wonder, mm -hmm. as you and other leaders in the pro-life movement evaluate strategy and, and strategy mm -hmm. and projects that you're conducting as an organization, how do you mm. remain faithful to your mission without being passed by by society sort of thing how do you make sure that the message is still um resonating with people in 2022 in the same way that it was in 1992 but in a way that we're not we're not just doing social media you and i have talked um away from yeah. uh, away from the microphone about social media and whatnot but how do you how do you stay contemporary in your engagement yet mm -hmm. tethered with your strategy i guess yeah, that's a good question. We spent a lot of time here at Created Equal uh, training uh, internally. And we have uh, books that we read together and we'll we'll go over them. We'll read them and, and do, you know, unpack them together. We call it tea time. We do it once a week and we spend several hours going over a particular topic, book, video, speech, what have you. And so, and, and this is helpful also because my colleague, uh, Seth Dreher is very, very, uh, good at this stuff. I mean, he, he, uh, is, I think one of the best in, in trying to develop or at least explain the biblical worldview that we, we, we need, we need to have a comprehensive worldview. What's going on in the world? We can't live, uh, as if these other things don't affect the abortion issue, right? So when it comes to critical race theory, I mean, we're, we're staying up on that. The whole gender revolution that's taking place across the world, and especially in North America, that affects us, right? Uh, I think the, the Great Reset, things like this, you know, these kinds of things we have to stay up on because it affects our work. Uh, and not to, I mean, it's not going to make us change the, what we do that much, but we need to understand it in the context of what's happening worldwide because abortion didn't occur or it didn't happen in a vacuum. I mean, it's just not separated from everything else. They're interconnected. We can have the best arguments against abortion, but we don't understand what's going on in culture when it comes to race theory and gender issues and, and all of what's happening worldwide with the, with the, this pandemic and all that stuff. I think we need to uh, understand and have a broader understanding so we can relate to the people who also are thinking about these other issues as well. That doesn't mean we get off topic per se, but I think people listen to you when they think, oh, this person knows more than just how to argue abortion. They understand what's going on in the world and I need to listen to them. And so that's something we really, uh, really teach our young people here. Uh, is is and, and, and it's a very deliberate, deliberate thing. I think a lot of pro-life groups, and, and there's reason for this, is they're focused on one issue. They're a one-issue organization. We are, but we understand that we have to have uh, a little more in our tool belt as we're talking to people because that isn't their one issue all the time, but they are all interconnected. Absolutely. And and I think that one thing that anchors everything together is that that tying of abortion victim photography with the conversations. And I'd love to get your mm -hmm. your take on the value of face to face conversations. Obviously, mm -hmm. there have been varying opportunities over the last two years in particular. Um, but I feel like there's a lot of people who like, like we've talked about, are, are very anxious to get onto the next thing because we're all looking for a silver bullet. We're all looking mm. for the great thing. And I think that at CCBR, we've had to ha have a shift of mentality that we're, we're often, I feel like, critical of groups that are just doing the billboard sort of thing. If, if, just, if we just get the right messaging on the billboard by the side of the highway, then I won't have to talk to anybody. Um, and I feel like at times I have fallen into that trap with abortion victim photography of like, if only I could get AVP up on that billboard, then I won't have yeah. to talk to anybody. Right. Um, Abortion victim photography, I would argue, and I'm, I think that we're probably all on the same page, that this is the greatest sure. tool that we have in our tool belt. Right. And yet, even with abortion victim photography, we need to have the conversations with not That's just right. our, our family, our friends, our neighbors, but in particular, those mm -hmm. in the public forum on street corners, on doorsteps sort of thing. How yep. do you continue to... Um, 
shepherd people forward in that front because I'm sure you have interns that come through, even staff members that'll come through that are very willing to have a, hold a sign, very willing to express a message, but have a very difficult time engaging in conversation and approaching strangers. Mm -hmm. And how do you share the value and and some of the the unsuspected um, opportunities that may present themselves through those conversations? Because I feel like a lot of people anticipate that by having conversation, you're only ever going to speak to the director of Planned Parenthood and and you're going to be <laughs> under fire constantly when in reality, our experience, at least in Canada, I'm sure it's probably fairly similar for you, is that most people haven't critically thought about the abortion issue for any meaningful amount of time. How do you help people come over, um, kind of overcome that hesitancy or anxiety that might come around mm -hmm. the conversations in particular? Yeah, well, there's a lot there. You know, I used to think that if only we could commandeer the CNN, CNN satellite <laughs> and, you know, communicate to the world the abortion victim video that we have, yeah. we could end this. I mean, yeah. that was one of my, like, you know, fantasies or dreams, yeah. you know. <laughs> we could just take over that satellite for five minutes. The world would be different. Well, yeah. I learned that that's not the case. I mean, even if we could do that, I mean, which would be kind of cool, although I bet you'd be <laughs> illegal and I'd be in prison. I'm not suggesting that, by the way, whoever's yeah. listening here from, <laughs> from the government. If we had taken it off of YouTube or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, I used to think that if only we could get these pictures in front of enough people, we could change culture in and of themselves, by themselves. Although they, they are, as you say, I think the most effective tool – to reach people and change hearts and minds. In themselves, they're inadequate. We have to have the conversations to back them up. And as culture continues to call, uh, coarsen, and we're seeing that, right? I'm not saying the pictures are less effective per se, but you better have an argument to back it up. And uh, so we train our people that social formers have historically used the public square. It's the passage of information person to person, small groups, larger groups that has always won the day. We today we're confronted with the notion that somehow if we just get enough social media posts on these big tech platforms that we can change culture. I think it's a fool's errand, frankly. I just think, well, first, you're preaching to the choir primarily. Secondarily, those who control access to those venues those platforms are not our friends. I mean, they're they're censoring things all over the place. And before long, and I've been warning my colleagues, I said, there's going to come a time those platforms are not going to be available to us. So we need here at Created Equal, I train our people. I say, listen, we got to behave like social media doesn't even exist. Because even if it does or doesn't, it doesn't eventually really matter because the way that you change culture is door is face to face and door to door or what have you. And so that's where we emphasize the one-on-one -on -one conversations with individuals on college high and high school campuses primarily. And you can walk away, and this is the other thing that's really important, you can have an effect on someone one-on-one. -on -one. You see them change their minds and they might change from being pro-abortion to being pro-life right before your eyes. You've altered this person's worldview and you probably altered the course of their lives in many respects sometimes because this begins the, uh, kind of putting the pebble in the shoe, as Greg Kogel says, to leading to other questions that they might be rethinking. So that's how we do things. Uh, I think it's a it's a mistake to put all our eggs in the social media basket. I think that's a that's a short term uh, thing. It's not going to be available to us long term. And historically, social reformers, those who have been effective have always done it in the public square. Yeah, on the social media thing, um, not to bank on Twitter, but here's hoping that Elon <laughs> Musk can do something uh, with Twitter. Just, just Yeah, uh, but you know, he, he's not on the board, though. Did you see that? He dropped I, off. I did, yeah. Um, Within days. <laughs> so I heard that he was limited to the amount of stock he could buy in the company if he was on the board. Right. So he has more options if he's well. Off. We're, we're still praying for influence there. I think he's a, that's right. He's he, he's for free speech. And that's a good thing. Yeah, yeah that's right, <laughs> Mark. Uh, a few months ago, like I referenced off the top, we had this conversation, um, sort of a a roundtable discussion, and one of the things that we asked you was, 
what were I'm not going to see if my memory serves correctly, but uh, what is something that you wished that uh, more people knew or more people asked you about? Um, mm -hmm. And you, um, you had an, an answer along the lines of you wish uh, people, certainly new people in the movement, uh, those who have joined within the last five years, perhaps, or 10 years, um, would be more curious about what took place in the pro-life movement before mm -hmm. they arrived. And, and yeah. correct me if my memory doesn't serve correctly uh, in, in that way, but um, could you elaborate on what you meant by that? And perhaps what are some of the key things that you wish people today uh, in the pro-life movement? I started in 2014 part-time and, and 2015 with CCBR. Um, so it's, it's not that long in the course of the pro-life movement. So what are some things that I should know about what happened before I showed up? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I love the fact that we've got lots of young people in our movement and the, and the movement is, is becoming younger and younger by the day, which is great. Here at our organization, that's what we focus on. Unfortunately, I think uh, along with that becomes uh, comes with it some kind of some naive, naivete, if you will, or inexperience. I think with that zeal that comes with the youth, they sometimes think, they figured it out. <laughs> you know, they know what exactly to do and and they're going to go do it without keeping this in context of history. And we can look at social reform history when it comes to civil rights and anti-child labor and and all those his uh, those movements that preceded the pro-life movement, but what we have not focused on is our own history. Uh, that includes Operation Rescue in the 19 late 18 the 1980s and early 1990s. And in the things that have gotten us to the place that we are right now, there's not enough emphasis on that. Uh, I have been noticing as I grow older, my buddies, my friends, the Operation Rescue, uh, if you will, generation is passing away. And along with that, their stories, their experience are, is, is passing away with them. So I, I just would uh, exhort young people who are coming into the movement, who have been around for a little while, listen to your elders who have the scars on their backs, who have been through the tough times and the good times. Listen to them because you have a lot to learn from them and you may not uh, actually you know, do the same things they did. Uh, that's okay because we're all, you know, things are changing. We have to be flexible. But you want to learn from them so you don't repeat their mistakes. And I, I see some of that happening, uh, but not enough. And I, I'd like to see more of our uh, the leaders of organizations that are in their 20s and 30s look to their elders, look to those who have preceded them, and get some advice, some mentoring, some, you know, some guidance, some discipling. Uh, I think that would bode well for our movement and ultimately, you know, the, the babies themselves. So, yeah. I, I think briefly, Kim, I know you want to jump in as well. I think briefly about the the times that we've been in the States doing um, some of our campus outreach in Florida and working with the likes of Frank DiOrio and uh, yeah. uh, uh, Bubba and my... my, my Bubba um, Garrett and Jim Bubba Davis Garrett, yeah. and... That's right. Yeah. And just, and just hearing their stories. <laughs> yeah. Sitting yeah. in the truck with them or sitting in the yeah. car with them and just hearing some of their stories is fantastic. That's so, what um, made New York City so much fun, frankly. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, Kristen Polo and and Blaze with you guys and, and some others, uh, Don Blythe and, and Andrew Karen from a Tiny Heartbeats out in wa uh, Washington. We just sat around and and listen to stories, you know, yeah, of, of yeah, things yeah. that we had done yeah. in the past. And and it was really and they were, you know, they're all eager to learn and hear about all of this. And I wish there was more of that uh, across our movement. Yeah. Are there. Um, so certainly it's important for us to have those conversations that we like, encourage people to. Are there perhaps books or resources that you would recommend that mm -hmm. maybe dive into the history of Operation Rescue yeah. or some of the other uh, activities that took place? Yeah, well, on our uh, YouTube page, we have an entire playlist of Operation Rescue videos that you can watch, and that'll give you a history of Operation Rescue. There's actually a video created for that purpose, too, that's on our YouTube page. Uh, the book Operation Rescue by Randall Terry is also a good one. There are others. I'd have to get back to you on a few of those, but um, some of the pre-Row uh, books talking about what happened prior to Roe versus Wade are important to read. Uh, Joe, Joe Foreman has one. I, it, the, the title escapes me right now, but it's one of the best. 
Uh, but the, I think learning the, the Operation Rescue movement, I think, is is one that I think we should learn from because it gave birth to activism. It gave birth to the great Cunninghams and the Mark Harringtons, Scott Clusidors, all of them. They came from that. Uh, it was the you know, it was the seed that Jesus talked about, the seed that fell to the ground and died. But because it died, it gave birth to a whole nother aspect of the of the activist movement within the pro-life a move and, and and so we have we have like I say we have a we can give them a debt of gratitude for the work they've done and they're still around a lot of them and they have a lot of stories to tell so I, I would exhort people to look into that. Love it. I I have talked to Peter and Jonathan Van Maren at, at CSPR here about doing a. I don't know if it's quite fair to call it a History Channel um, <laughs> series within the podcast yeah, of, of be, be, because there's so many people that like have never even come onto my radar. Like I, I have followed the stream of apologetics so much. And so I'm very familiar with the the names like Randy Alcorn and Scott Klusendorf and whatnot. Mm -hmm. I didn't yeah. know who Mark Crutcher was until like four months yeah. ago. I didn't really? know so many of the names that are out there. Um, even Dr. Monica Miller, I'd only heard her name bounced mm -hmm. around <clears throat> a time or two. And so getting familiar with uh with the Absolutely. the mainstays and by the and way, the her book Abandoned is probably one of the best books to read. Exactly. Uh, you mentioned, it's you mentioned the next books. book that I'm reviewing. Yeah. yeah. Ab Abandoned is probably one of the best, uh, not just on the history of, the, of uh, Operation Rescue or that, but that time period of the late 80s, mm. early 90s. Uh, and Monica Miller is one of the best. She's a hero. She's yeah. an absolute hero. Absolutely. Um, I, I know that we're coming towards the end of our time here, Peter. I know that you're probably going to ask about how to get connected, but Mark, what's coming down the tube for you going forward that, that we don't want to, we don't want to pretend like you're, you're some aged hero up on the <laughs> shelf. You are, you are probably more, more active than most people in the movement. I mean, you're probably more active uh, than I Peter am and aging I. though. This is right true. Now. I am aging as we all are. It's true. It's, it's a good it's thing. True. I mean, it goes with, that's what all, it's all about. Uh, well, it, you mentioned uh, to start out the program about what we're planning if and when uh, Roe versus Wade is overturned. We're all praying and hoping and believing that that's going to take place. Certainly the pro-abortion industry in America thinks it's going to happen. Uh, they may be just doing that to gin up everybody. But uh, uh, and many of us believe it's the, that either uh, Roe's going to be degraded significantly or it's going to be overturned altogether. And so we have we have plans. You know, we don't know exactly what the landscape's going to look like, but there are things that we're already putting into place to try to get ahead of the curve, if you will. Uh, one of the things is, uh, you know, we're going to have these abortion deserts and abortion havens in America. There's going to be the red states and the blue states. The blue states are where the abortions are happening and will continue, and the red states is where they're going to be banned. Well, we have to be able to figure out what, how do we navigate that landscape? You know, it's a, not a federal issue anymore where the Supreme Court is the one making the decisions. It's going to be the state legislatures. Where do we focus our activity? Uh, that's number one. Number two is we're going to be creating um, opportunities for like an ultrasound unit, a mobile unit that'll be on the roll because that's what they're doing. They're They're going on the road with this. They're starting to uh, you know, perform abortions in mobile units. And that's probably the future. Uh, the biggest challenge, and I don't need to tell you guys this, is the, is the abortion pill, uh, how that's going to be proliferated uh, if Roe is overturned. It, it, it is now even, but one and if Roe is overturned, I mean, that all, all rules from the Biden administration will be off. I mean, you'll be, unfortunately, women will be able to get the abortion pill online without a face-to-face -face meeting with an abortion doctor or anybody else. And so that's a, a huge challenge for us. We're trying to figure out how we address it. And I think most of the movement is, is trying to figure that out. That's going to be a new battlefront for us. Yeah, that's right. And that's something important for all activists to know about as well as the abortion pill, the mm -hmm. um, side effects of the abortion pill and, and just all of that, all of those details. Mark, um, this also highlights the importance of us getting involved in the movement and learning more. You are the host of the Mark Harrington Show, um, a radio activist, as you call yourself. You're also the founder <laughs> and leader of Created Equal. Um, and for, for our friends in the States who are listening to this, if you uh, want to get involved in the movement in any way, Created Equal is the place to go. So, Mark, direct us to where we ought to go uh, to learn more about the podcast, to learn more about the Justice Ride and some of the other projects you do with Created Equal. 
two websites, createdequal.org for the organization. By the way, we have a new piece. You guys got to look into this. It's called Let's Talk Abortion. We just released it. And it just walks you through how to talk to your parents, how to talk to your children, how to talk to your neighbor, how to talk to the person on the street. It, it just lays it out. Seth Dreher spent probably six months working on this. We just released it. You can go to createdequal.org. You'll see it there. Let's Talk Abortion. Uh, so createdequal.org. And if you are interested in following me on social media, if you want to listen to the radio program, just go to markharringtonshow.com. We have a video of the program. It's once a week. Also, it's on all the popular podcasting platforms. I typically interview the unsung heroes of our movement, those who are doing the work day in, day out, that don't get all the publicity of all the you know other folks that are you know got the big platforms. But these are the faithful ones, the ones that we can learn from. I deal with some of the bigger issues that are confronting us as a movement. As someone who's been around for a few years, you know, I have a little bit of insight in all that. And uh, so I think you'd enjoy the program if you just go to markharringtonshow.com and you can figure out what type of platform you want to follow the show on there. Perfect. Mark, thank you so much for taking the time and joining us today. Great to be here. All right, Cam. I am just going to check the link for Let's Talk About Abortion Conversation. The Conversation Navigator is talk dot created equal dot org so we're going to put that in our show notes as well talk dot created equal dot org don't forget to visit the other websites as well mark's uh podcast and uh, some of the projects that created equal does do get involved if you are in ohio or around ohio or maybe in another part of the united states and want to travel to ohio uh, do get involved with some of the best uh pro-life activists and some of the best pro-life apologists um, and and speakers and presenters in the United States. Cam, any final thoughts as we wrap this up? I mean, first of all, just a huge amount of appreciation for Mark Harrington and so many others who have laid the foundation for people like you and I, Peter, that um, have done the hard work, have done all of the kind of gathering of information, not only the apologetics like we talked briefly about, but more so even the structuring and the strategy of how to build a sustainable pro-life movement that can change hearts, change minds, and ultimately transform culture. We look at what they're accomplishing now in the States. They are far from over on the abortion war, unfortunately, but they are far closer than they were when Mark Harrington first got involved. He's one of my mentors in the pro-life movement. I love talking with Mark. We spent like 45 minutes talking to him um, uh, last time he was on the show um, with the, the round table, and it was phenomenal. And just an incredible godly man. I've met, I believe, three of his kids, incredible human beings as well. Shout out to Luke and Dylan, particularly. Um, I got to know them at one of the Florida mission trips that I went down on. Um, but yeah, I, I think this is super valuable when it comes to counting the cost when it comes to entering into the pro-life movement. That This is not for the faint of heart, but the good Lord provides with abundance and through his incredible generosity um, to all those who do, do get involved. And that's not limited to full-time staff. It's not like um, you're not going to get any <laughs> any blessings from God unless you come on full-time staff. But I, I can certainly say from personal experience that um, they, they only multiplied. The more um, I have been able to surrender myself and, and give more of myself and my time towards this mission, it, it has only been um, a joy in receiving back the blessings that God deems fit. And so it, it's incredible. Consider it for yourself. If you're interested in learning more about careers or, or jobs or whatever it may be, um, please touch base with me in particular. Um, C Cote at endthekilling.ca, C C O T E at endthekilling.ca. If you want to be um, joining on staff with us, if this has inspired you to come on staff in the pro life movement, then hit me up. We'll talk about a few of the roles that we have and, and the, the route on how to um, come on staff. Perfect, Cam. And while you're thinking about getting on staff, do check out our merch shop. You can buy Stuck, which Cam referenced uh, <clears throat> on the top in the introduction, a complete guide to discussing, wait, a complete guide to answering tough questions about abortion. We also have this book back here, Patriots, the Untold Story of Ireland's Pro-Life Movement by our colleague Jonathan Van Maren, along with The Culture War and a number of other items like that shirt that Cam is wearing. Looks great on you, sir. And it would look great on all of our listeners as well. Your contributions and your purchase will go directly to uh, well, number one, paying for uh, our our uh, cost of the book and the shirt. Um, but after that, uh, all the profits are going to go to the podcast and to the teams that we have on the streets, um, helping to get the message uh, on the airwaves a lot more 
and 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 better <laughs> as a strange sentence <laughs> uh, but also get the message in the public square as well so uh that's prolifeguys.com shop thank you so much everyone and we hope you tune in again next time <laughs>